Friday, August the 17th at noon, and I've got some questions that have been emailed in this week for Free Advice Friday, but I would love it if you guys would start typing your questions into the question box. You may have questions this week. There's a lot of you on the call, and I'm looking forward to answering your questions as well as all the questions I have here on the system. All right. So with that, let me get started. Um, some of the questions that, that came in this week were about Free Advice Friday itself and whether or not we could do things a little differently on the web page. And so here is, here's the new plan. Uh, the first question was whether or not it would be possible to create a, a general folder that has materials that I may mention. Uh, right now, I create a separate uh, starting last week, I started creating a separate line item, a separate page by date. So the August 3rd one is up there, uh, and you click on the link that says August 3rd, and it takes you to the video replay, the transcript, and all the materials and the links that I mentioned. I, uh, Because of my travels, it took me a little while to get everything up, but everything's updated. You'll see August 10th uh, by 5 o'clock tonight. You'll see August 17th. But Walter was asking if I could create a folder simply called resources. Um, and so the answer is yes, I would be happy to. So on Free Advice Friday, uh, everything will be included in the date. But if you're just looking for downloads for PDFs or Word documents, you can go right to the resources folder. Another thing that I was asked about the... Free Advice Friday is how long they're going to keep going on. See, those of you who have been here for the last 10 weeks know that this was just supposed to be a 10-week experiment, but it's going so well. You guys seem to have lots of questions. Um, I'm getting several hundred hits every week from on the replays. Um, last week's replay uh, showed up six, 600 replays were, were played. I don't know how many people um, that was, but it was it was actually watched 600 times just since last Friday. So I'm going to keep going. Uh, every Friday, I will be here at noon if you got for, until you guys get bored with me. So it's you and me. So start asking those questions. All right. The next question I got, which was from a woman named, we're, we're going to call her P, uh, a woman who, uh, initial P, she comes out with children's books, and she wants to know if there's enough interest in illustrated children's picture books in the library market for her to put them into an ebook format. I hope you guys know that if I don't know the answer to something, I check it out. This one I was unsure of, but because she emailed me early, I was able to check into it. The librarians that I spoke to all told me, this was uniform, there was no exceptions, all told me that children's illustrated picture books in ebook are by far their weakest category and they don't spend a lot of money on them that that they middle grade readers absolutely um, young readers read you know re, uh, learn to read on ebook absolutely but picture books are have just not made the jump in the library market that I think P is looking for the librarians say that there's not enough demand and so they don't spend a lot of their money on illustrated picture books. Children's books are, are e-books like crazy, please understand. But the younger ones is what I'm talking about. You know, board books sort of thing. So P, I hope that answers your question. Uh, let's see, what's the next question? Someone is asking if I can recommend somebody that can format e-books, both for uh, like illustrated children's books like P was asking for and other kinds. There is a woman that I use. Um, I get nothing by recommending her. Um, I don't even think she likes me very much. I, honest to God, I think, uh, uh, you know, we tolerate each other. But she's amazing. Her name is Sumi Goswami. And um, I'm going to the chat box right now and I am typing in Sumi's email address. Sumi, uh, as you can tell from her name, lives overseas. Um, yeah, she's uh, got a fantastic company. And here is her name. I am cutting and pasting it into the chat box. Here is her name and her email address. Let's see, chat. Type all messages. And here is her name and her email address. And I hope if anyone's looking to get an ebook formatted, they will uh, call or email Sumi. One of the reasons why I like her is she's so inexpensive. 
my book is 200 pages and she did she turned it into a gorgeous ebook for I believe the grand total was $45 uh, she was very inexpensive and when we found some mistakes one of you uh, a, a woman who I met in st. Louis a couple weeks ago found a couple of pages that had the file had gotten corrupted and oh my gosh um, I sent it right back to Sumi and she fixed it that day uh, for those of you who are typing questions into the chat box, I, I, I'll answer your question, but guys, go over to the Q&A box because I, I can't always see the chat box. Uh, but uh, A, a, a lovely author uh, whose first initial is A, is asking how important it is for worldcat.org for a library look, book listing. She recently got her novel into the library in Queens, and she doesn't see it listed on WorldCat. Australian libraries are listed, but not the most recent library purchase. How can she get it listed? Um, uh, Larry and Patricia, those of you who are asking um, about Sumi's um, about Sumi's email and and name, let me post it again. Um, maybe maybe we're having technical difficulties, but I'm I'm posting it a couple times. There it is. Okay. So anyway, back to A's question. Okay, worldcat.org is a reflection. It, it is, it's, it's not the driver, it is the, it is the uh, reporter, it's the reflection. It, 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 it reflects the data that is in what is called the MARC database, M-A-R-C, all caps, M-A-R-C database. The M-A-R-C database is the official database that all libraries pull from and launch into. Now, it depends on your local library, especially in Queens, New York. But some libraries are a little understaffed in their cataloging department. So here is how it works to get into WorldCat, because it is important. If libraries are going to be your focus, you want your book properly documented and listed in WorldCat. A listing in WorldCat for your book includes all of the pertinent catalog and publication block information. You need the author name, the author birth date, death date if there is one, previous books by that author, who the publisher is, what the Dewey Decimal uh, code is for that subject, is there more than one BISEC code, all the BISEC codes, the ISBN, the pub date, the format it's in, all of that goes into a block of data that is put in a very specific way into the MARC, M-A-R-C, database. And then once that happens, worldcat.org will have access to and will be able to show librarians your book and all of its pertinent data. One of the nice things about being in the MARC database and on worldcat.org is if a library looks you up and decides they want to take you in, that librarian knows that they don't have to hand key in every little thing about your book. They don't need to look up the Dewey Decimal number. They don't need to try and figure out your BISAC code. It's a lot of work. They don't want to do it. They're overworked. They're understaffed. It's already done for them. They can simply go into WorldCat, go into the MARC database, which is um, um, all driven by this you know, international amazing system. And they will be able to pull that data out right into their computer, and bing, bang, boom, it all goes up easy peasy as pie. They love that. So getting your title information into WorldCat is very important. And if you are calling or listening in from the United States, the easiest way to get your book into that database is to get a PCIP code created and, and formatted by a certified catalog librarian. They will charge you for their time, 100 bucks, give or take. Uh, and I, I, when Unique was in business, they were charging 125 to 150 depending on how fast you needed it. I, you guys know I like the Donahue group, uh, dgi-inc.com. But the, the thing is, is that you do need to get this publisher catalog and publication block done professionally. But if you're asking about the library listing on WorldCat that they have your book, that's up to the library. See, librarians will bring a book in, and, and then authors will start calling me and say, well, my library carries my book. How come it's not in the WorldCat database? Well, it may not show up there for weeks or months. Maybe never, but I'm hoping at least months. 
sometimes these catalogation, these catalog and uploading to WorldCat, that's pretty low on their list of things they want to do to get through their day. And I don't know about you guys, but I here, here's my to-do pile. This was empty on Monday. This is my to-do pile. This has to get done by the end of today because this, you know, I, I like to clear it out before every weekend. Um, so if I had to do cataloging to let people know I had a certain book, that would be way off the list. The librarians, I'm guessing, are probably in the same boat. They'll get to it eventually. Or, you know, they, what they do is they hire a vendor, uh, a you know, someone to come in on a temporary basis once a quarter or every six months or once a year and key in and, and upload all of their new acquisitions. Maybe they depend upon the wholesaler to do it for them. And, and, you know, if you went through Ingram or if they went through Baker and Taylor to get your book, they just haven't gotten to it yet. Be patient. It's coming. Now, A, I will tell you that there are lots of libraries that will never list your book in WorldCat, even though they carry your book. That doesn't mean that it's not valid. It doesn't, you can perhaps ask them to, but it may just be, mean that either it slipped through the cracks, they don't consider uh, reporting to WorldCat really important for them. But most librarians, you'll see it within six months or so. All right. So there you go. I hope that was a good answer to that question. For those of you who are curious about MARC databases and PCIP, I am putting into the chat a link to my blog. And I will put in, here, let me write this down so I don't forget, get the, the handy dandy pen out. Um, I will also put up an article that um, I, I actually interviewed a, a librarian at length about MARC databases and, and all this. I've got it all in a blog, which I will put in the August 17th Free Advice Friday folder. So I hope that helps. Last week, um, okay, A is now asking where to find someone to upload to the MARC database. All right, I, I will type that in too. Here is my favorite company. I absolutely adore DGI dash inc slash the donahue group donahue group is a terrific company um, let me just click real quick and make sure that url works properly but if you go to the donahue group and ask for a pcip you're nope let's see that is not correct so let me let me get this correct um, the donahue group see if i can multitask i have not been great at multitasking this week for those of you who are on my mailing list you know i've been totally screwing up this week and it's hysterical all right there's no dash dgiinc.com so here let me go back to zoom and get that in my apologies guys here is the correct url dgiinc.com that's where to go and you, if you want to just find out about getting a PCIP done, um, PCIP, there's the link to that page. They can teach you anything you want to know about this stuff or my blog. Last week, uh, a woman whose name uh, begins with R uh, uh, wrote and asked if librarians consider bookstores to be competition. And I didn't know the answer. So I went ahead and I called Mary G and a couple of my favorite librarians and I asked them. They all said absolutely not. Um, that librarians do not consider bookstores the competition in any way, shape, or form. They don't really consider any more than dentists and doctors would consider them, which was a, an analogy I, you know, we came up with when I was talking to one of my librarian buddies. Um, dentists and doctors both kind of technically do the same thing. They both have a lot of the same skills, but you don't go to them for the same reason. Um, I then asked a friend of mine uh, out in Palmyra, New York, who owns a bookstore, or I should say owned a bookstore out there, if she considered libraries competition. And she said, yes. So that is what I'm going to be digging into in the next week. I want to write a blog about what librarians and bookstores think of each other. At the moment, librarians have no problem with bookstores. But I was intrigued that my friend um, who used to own a bookstore said that, yes, libraries were definitely competition for bookstores, but not the other way around. So I didn't know the answer last week. That's the answer I have for you today. And I am going to start researching this topic so it can be my next blog. I hope that helps. 
Jean, uh, Jay, I'm just going to start you. Hi, how you doing? It's good to see you, or sort of see you. You're considering redoing your cover again, and your designer has flown the coop. Do I have any suggestions for women fiction that won't break the bank? I do. I'm sorry your designer has flown the coop, um, but here's where I am with cover design. I, um, for about $300, I, I have been hiring a woman that I really, that I found through one of my clients, and, and she found her through 99designs, and her name is Mila, and I would be very happy to recommend Mila to you guys. Um, she does great work. She charges $300 for covers. Here, I will, I will throw her, her email address into the chat box. Let me just find it real quick. Here we go, and um, bum, bum, bum. so Mila, whom I, I'm only going to use her first name, uh, you know, you guys can, I'm sending you her email address real quick, but um, Mila, who I found through 99designs, and whose email address uh, is milagraphicartist at gmail.com, she charges approximately $300 to do, and she does great covers, both fiction and nonfiction, I can recommend her. If $300 is still a little steep for you. There's a couple of sites that I have recently found. They're template sites that I really like. And I, I don't have them off the top of my head, the, the websites, but I do have a list of them. So let me, uh, let me quickly see if I can find um, that list of, of sites. There's two sites in particular one of which you'll pay about $50 for a cover, and the other one you'll pay about $80 for a cover. So um, these two sites, which I don't have, as I said, off, I'm, I'm looking, you guys see I'm not looking at you because I'm looking to see if I can quickly pull it up from my, um, from my email, and I, I, don't have, I don't have them ready to go, but I will. Give me an hour or two, and I will post uh, both covered template sites that I like and that I've used just for mock-up. I, I never use them for final covers, but you can. They're very inexpensive. And don't forget Joel Friedlander, Joel from thebookdesigner.com. He's got some great covered templates that you might want to consider. So if you want to spend 50 bucks, you're going to probably use a template, and I'll get you that those links. And if you want a designer to really work with you, I highly recommend Mila at milagraphicartist at gmail.com. She's, um, she, you know, works overseas again. She, you'll only communicate with her via email. Uh, but she's really terrific. All right. Other questions. I, I hope this is working for you guys. Uh, let's see. Dee is asking, his nonfiction book has several illustrations that clarify the text. Any suggestion about how to translate that to an audio book? Well, David, it reminds me a little of my songwriter days where someone said, if, if you need to introduce the song, then you're not done writing it. And I would say to you that if you need illustrations to fully get your point across, you might, you're, maybe you're not done writing it. See, the written word is a very particular tool, and and not every book needs to be an audio book. I mean, a, a visual book. I mean, how would you make the Polar Express an audio book? How would you make Good Night Moon an audio book? It doesn't work. I mean, what you want to do is go to YouTube and have the picture of Good Night Moon. And you know the the text as it's reading, or if you can get a Samuel L. Jackson to read it, or Christopher Walken, it's even better. Uh, have you guys seen those creepy guys, those amazingly funny creepy guys reading children's books on YouTube? It's hysterical. But D, um, I I'm somewhat familiar with your book. I'm a little familiar with it, and I'm here to say I think your book would work as an audio book, even though the illustrations clarify. Um, you may need to rewrite a few parts of it just to at, that so you stop saying you know look at this chart or th as this chart indicates you would have to rewrite the book for the audio but consider whether or not it's even a good fit uh, perhaps what your book should be is maybe you should do a live presentation with with screenshots and with the images you know not PowerPoint oh we're all sick of PowerPoint but using some sort of of projection software create a video 
that people could watch on YouTube or on, and they could download and purchase from your own site? Maybe that's more the answer. Um, but I, from what I know, for those of you who have illustrations in your book, uh, if you're going to do an audio book, it means you're going to have to rewrite the book a bit for the audio. For those of you who are asking about Joel Friedlander and his info again, his site is, and I'm putting it into the chat box, thebookdesigner.com. Joel Friedlander has fantastic interior and cover templates on his site. And, uh, and I like his work. But there's, there's other sites, too, that I would recommend. Um, I hope that helps. All right, let's see. We've got some more questions coming in here. Um, bum, bum, bum. All right, now you guys can hear me. You can see me. Let's go back to these questions. Um, oh, a, a woman who's, whose first initial begins with P got a email from me this week. Oh, I was really messing up this week. You guys have no idea. Um, not my finest week. But she got an email from me this week. Um, I had sent out, I'm at quarter four. Uh, October 1st is the fourth quarter uh, for most, a lot of municipalities. And I'm hosting a library mailing. And I sent out an email about the library mailing and told everyone that 10,000 libraries, I'd be emailing 10,000 libraries for $499. Well, I screwed up. The, uh, the price is actually $399. And my assistant came running in yelling at me the next morning. But P, um, who very rightfully uh, said, here's a question for your Free Advice Friday. She said, can you explain to me why somebody would spend $500 for this mailing when they can just get a database themselves and email the bookstores, uh, the libraries themselves? And I thought that was a very valid question. So even though it's about one of my programs, I am going to say to you that this program, which is actually $400, that's a lot of money. Why would you pay me $400 to email libraries when you can email them yourself? Absolutely. And the answer is you shouldn't. Um, I have a cleaning lady. I, 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 I'm not particularly well off. I, I drive a 14-year-old car. I, I mean, I'm, you know, I don't live the life of Riley. But no matter how tight things get and how tough things get, I, my cleaning lady is important to me because I hate cleaning that much. It is worth it to me to pay this woman, I pay her $80, to come to my house and to clean my house. It would take me five or six hours to clean my house as well as she and her team do in two hours, less than two hours. They go through, they get it all done in an hour and a half, maybe two hours depending. I tip them beautifully because I'm not a jerk. And they go away and they come back a week later. Why am I spending my hard-earned money to have this woman clean my house when I could do it? It's not that I don't have the time, but I, I don't want to spend my four or five hours cleaning my house. I would rather give her the $100. So I have decided to trade my money for time. And because she's really good at it, I'm not that good of a cleaner. I couldn't actually clean my house to the level that would make me happy to live in. I miss things. Um, she's awesome. So the same thing is true, P, for mailings. You can go. Uh, onto Google, and you can start Googling email addresses of librarians. There are some states that put them right out there. Others don't. Um, but you would be able to find more than enough libraries and start sending out these emails on your own, and you should. But it takes a lot of time. And uh, you cannot just buy a library list anywhere. My list that I update quarterly through part of my classes, and, and the, my list is an opt-in list. Librarians have agreed to be on it. I'm not spamming them. Uh, they've been part of this program for a while, and when I add someone new, they've agreed to be added. I don't just throw their email on a list. And this is not a purchase list. This is an organic list that I've been building. For those of you who have known me in the library market for a while, you know that a year, year and a half ago, I only had 24, 2,500 library email addresses in my list. You know that because that's what I was advertising. Now I have almost 10,000. So, well, a little over 10,000. Um, so, you know, my list has grown organically over the last year. You can do that too, and you should. Uh, you guys have heard me say this before. Do not spend money you don't have. Time, money, talent. Pick any two. If you've got talent and time, that's what you should be spending. If you've got talent and money, but you don't have a lot of time, well, then spend your money and let someone else do it for you. 
Um, if you have money and time, but you have no talent, well, then that's another argument, and we'll talk about that. Um, so uh, this three ninety nine deal, which was supposed to be, uh, it, it was advertised accidentally as four ninety nine. This three ninety nine deal, this librarian deal, is only good till next Friday. Um, but you guys know me. I mean, those of you, come on, who has never emailed me and asked for a deal later and then didn't get it? So just email me if you want to be part of this library mailing. But between now and next Friday, we are, we've got 24 spots that we're doing for people. And, uh, and once those 24 spots are gone, they're gone. We don't want to mail libraries hundreds of books. They'll get exhausted. So uh, if you miss this one, you can be in the next one, which will be a few months down the road. Thank you, P, for that question. It was very fair, and I'm glad you asked me to suggest it on Free Advice Friday, and that's, that's why we charge the money for the time. All right. Let's see. Next question. Um, Jay is asking, do libraries purchase the same price as bookstores uh, from the wholesalers? Let's talk a little bit about the math. Um, uh, and again, for those of you who are right, typing questions into the chat box, I'm begging you to put it in the Q&A box. I'm trying to keep my eyes on both. It's hysterical. I'm, I've got the questions from my email here, the Q&A here, the chat here. Um, but I'm, I'm begging you, please go to the Q&A box, um, A, uh, Annette. Uh, th throw them in there, and I promise I will, I will do my best to answer. But I will get to your questions. Um, okay, so Jay is asking... Um, do libraries purchase at the same price as bookstores? No. No, they don't. Of course, they don't want anyone to know that, but the fact is, is that libraries buy from wholesalers. Wholesalers buy the books from you. So they're the middleman. Bookstores buy from wholesalers. Wholesalers will then buy the books from you. They're the middleman. They're the middleman any way you look at it. Yes, you can skip the middleman. You can go from this guy, you know, from, from you right to the bookstore or right to the library. But most of the time, they're going to want to stop at the wholesaler because the libraries and bookstores like the service and, and the ease of not having to deal directly with 20 different publishers a week. They just want to deal with one guy. So if this is you and this is the wholesaler and this is the, the bookstore, um, the bookstore will buy from the wholesaler at approximately a 40% discount off the retail price of your book. If you've got a $10 book, they're going to pay the wholesaler $6 for that book, and the wholesaler will turn around and they'll pay you $5. The wholesaler will keep a dollar, the bookstore will keep $4, you get to keep $5. You pay your expenses out of that $5. You pay for printing, you pay for everything that, that you have to pay for. The wholesaler pays for their expenses out of their $1. They pay for the gas, the trucking, the employees, keeping the lights on, customer service from their $1. The bookstore, they pay their expenses out of their $4. Store employees, keeping the lights on, advertising, rent, which is huge, you know, or, you know, their mortgage. That's how that works. So that is the way the math works. The math works the same even if this little pinky is a library. The library will pay for a $10 book, a wholesaler, but they're only going to pay the wholesaler $8. I mean, the, the wholesaler is going to actually, the wholesaler will still buy the book from you for $5. It's a $10 book. They'll buy it for $5. But they're going to turn around and sell that book to the library for $8, and they're going to keep $3 for themselves. Why? Well, because the wholesaler is doing a lot more work for the library than it is for a bookstore. That's one of the reasons. They are usually choosing the books for the library. They are usually doing the cataloging. They are usually, in many cases, actually doing the racking. They do a lot more work for the library than they do for a bookstore. But here's another reason that wholesalers get to charge more to libraries and do not give libraries the same depth of discount that they give bookstores. Tradition. Tradition. Libraries get a, a smaller discount from bookstores because they've never demanded it. That's just the truth. They've never demanded it. If libraries rose up as a whole and demanded a deeper discount, they'd probably get it. I bet you some libraries already do. I would be extremely surprised if New York and L.A. and Chicago and those weren't, off, weren't getting a deeper discount than the normal 20%. Um, 
but I don't know that for sure because it's none of my business and nobody would tell me, nor should they. It is none of my business what wholesalers and libraries do um, in the privacy of their own business arrangements. But that, I hope, uh, Jay, I hope that answers your question. Because, uh, yes, they both buy the same way, but they both pay different amounts for the most part. All right, so A, uh, Annette is saying uh, her ebook is available to libraries via the Kobo dashboard. That's terrific. Kobo owns Overdrive. Guys, are you guys all familiar uh, that libraries, they buy and license ebooks? from Overdrive. Overdrive is pretty much the only way that libraries get ebooks and audiobooks into their system. Overdrive owns the library market for ebooks and audiobooks. And Annette is available to the libraries through Overdrive because she's in Kobo. Kobo.com, K-O-B-O, a Toronto-based company that owns Overdrive, is one of my favorite companies to work with. And any of you, run, don't walk to Kobo.com and get your own account. It's a wonderful way to get into the international ebook market and the library market for ebooks. And she wants to know what she can do on her part to promote the ebook to libraries. And that is pretty simple. I actually teach a class on this that um, you know, a lot of you guys have taken. Um, you put together a list of the ways that you can be of help to the library. Can you drive patrons to their location? Are you going to be getting people to go to the library and try checking out your book? Are you going to be advertising? Perhaps you could take out some Facebook ads where when they click on the ad for your book, it takes them directly to their local library. You can put those links up. You can do a, a regional Facebook ad just in Atlanta, Georgia and have the, the click, the Facebook click, go right to, to the, the Atlanta library system. Uh, there's lots you can do to promote a book for a library. And once you've got that idea together, then you start contacting libraries in that system and telling them your ideas. Telling them that you'd like to work with them. That if they would consider stocking your book, especially your ebook, which is available through Overdrive, and your print book is available probably through Ingram, if you've gone through Ingram Spark or Create Space Extended Distribution. Here's all the ways you plan on supporting the library. Perhaps they would like to sue to um, get your book in. Here's the, the basic bare minimum that a book needs to get into a library. It has to have reviews. It has to have reviews. If you don't have a lot, and by a lot, I mean dozens and dozens and dozens of Amazon reviews, and at least a couple of legitimate, higher level, third party, independent editorial reviews, stop, go get some. Go get endorsements, go get reviews, uh, get your Amazon reviews up, then approach the libraries. Libraries like to see proof. They like to see third-party, independently verified proof that a book is good. The second thing a library likes to see, demand. The easiest way to get your book into a library is to send a sheet out about your book with the ISBN and the cover and to all of your friends across the country and to have them take that sheet into their local library and tell the librarian that they'd like to check that book out and could the library please order it. If you can get a couple of people in a town to request your book, you'll be surprised. Actually, maybe you wouldn't be, but you really, you'll be pleased at how fast your book gets ordered. If their patrons are asking for the book, they're going to order that book. That, that's, I mean, librarians want to serve their patrons. All right, I hope that answers that question. Um, now, A is now asking, uh, if you're in the MARC database, will it, does it improve the chance of a library purchasing the book? Yes. Uh, please keep in mind that a WorldCat listing or being in the MARC, all caps, guys, MARC, all caps, it's an acronym for something that at the moment I can't remember because I'm having a weird week. Um, but I will jot it down on uh, the Free Advice Friday page, I promise, that if you're in the MARC database, it does increase your chances of getting picked up by a library. Now that doesn't mean that if you don't have a PCIP, a publisher and catalog and publication block on your copyright page, and if you're not in the MARC database, which is hosted by OCLC, OCLC, if, if you're not there, it doesn't mean the library won't take you. It just means they're gonna have to work a little harder, and they might be annoyed by that, and they might not want to. I don't know about you, but sometimes I get in a mood. And uh, if I've got two things that I can do and one is easy and one's going to take some effort, 
lots of times I'll just do the easy one and I'll skip the one that takes effort. So if libraries are important to you, you really need a publisher and catalog in publisher catalog and publication block, PCIP, and you need to be in that MARC database. And the DGI group can help you with that. Uh, T is asking if I can give example of a wholesaler so that I can, she can better understand my references. Yes, here are wholesalers for the bookstore market. Out in Bayonne, New Jersey, there's Bookazine. Out west, there's America West. There's Ingram Wholesaler. Don't confuse that with Ingram Distribution. Ingram Distribution is another division of Ingram. It's a whole other company. Uh, but Ingram Wholesaler is, again, a wholesaler is a middleman who buys books from the publisher and turns around and sells them to their customers, bookstores and libraries. Baker and Taylor is the name of a, of a wholesaler you may have heard of. In the library market, you've got Follett in Midwest Library Services. You've got Brodart out in Pennsylvania. So those are some examples of wholesalers, and I hope that helps. Uh, Kay is asking if a third-party reviewer will consider a book that's been out for eight months. Uh, she thought that they only did preview arcs three or four months before publication. Okay, sort of. There's, there's five or six big companies, Publishers Weekly, Kirkus, Forward, Booklist. Okay, those are the biggies, and they need to see your book before publication date. But there's tons, and there are thousands, thousands of other places that can review your book that don't need your book to be before the publication date. And no, eight months is not too old. It's a little long in the tooth to be asking for reviews, but if you didn't ask for reviews, what are you going to do? It's kind of like this. If you've never actually, if you, you know, uh, this is a horrible analogy, but did I mention I'm having a weird week? This is the, the best one I can come up with at the moment. If you've got a three-year-old and you've never made him brush his teeth ever, um, that's not great. But you have a choice now. Do you make him brush his teeth or do you just keep not brushing his teeth because you haven't before? Um, okay, that probably is a really bad analogy, and if I had kids, I'd be very aware of how horribly offensive it is, but it's the only one I could think of. Same is true for your book. You should have gotten reviews beforehand. You didn't. Oh, well. Um, there's tons of bloggers out there. Start Googling them, book review blog sites, top book review sites, and, and start sending letters out to them with, connect. you know, Offer your book in an electronic format to start or in print if you can afford it and start asking people if they will review your book. Ask every day. You know, ask one or two people every day for the life of your book, even if it's eight, nine, ten months old. Sure. So that would be my advice to you. Uh, Kay, you ha do have a lot of reviews. Uh, if you, it, it says here that you've got 35 reviews, just not from the big guys. They don't need to be from the big guys. They need to be from independent, um, legitimate places. I mean, even Midwest Book Review. They're not big, but th libraries love a Midwest Book Review. Um, and James and his crew would be happy to, to, to review your book. And if Midwest is not happy to review your book, there's lots of other blogs out there. I would recommend that you, that you be very hesitant to spend money on a review. If... Kirkus Discoveries or Clarion from the Forward Company, if any of these companies come asking you for money in exchange for a review, I'd skip it. Librarians do not consider a Clarion review or a Kirkus Discoveries review an independent third-party review. They consider it a paid-for review. So if that's why you're doing it, save yourself the couple hundred bucks and spend that time and money going after uh, reviewers that are lower on the totem pole, but will get a lot more attention from the libraries. A uh, question here. A friend has suggested that A researches and finds a special sales rep and hire them to represent her book to the wholesale market on commission. Um, Annette, you're, uh, you, that's probably a good plan if your book is very, very successful right now. No rep is going to, unless, I mean, you can hire a college kid and, and try and make a deal with him, but a legitimate, already experienced sales rep is not going to take you on commission if, they, if they're not confident that they're going to make a lot of money on those commissions. See, 
sales reps have a very limited, it's called a bag. They've got a bag, and because back in the day, they used to walk around with these huge tote bags um, filled with catalogs. And those catalogs and those publishers hire them and pay them 10 to 15% commission. In some cases, 20. In some cases, 5. It depends on the account and, and how it's working. But they pay them a commission, let's say 12%, to be, you know, to be fair, to sell their book. Well, they can't take everyone uh, because then they would never have time. They have to focus on the guys that are going to make them the most money. So if your book, if you can prove that your book has the ability to make them quite a bit of money, they will happily take you on. Most micro-publishers and single title authors or even authors with just a few titles, most of them aren't making enough money. They're not profitable enough to attract a commission sales rep. And you probably would be better off training a local assistant or somebody in your area to start picking up the phone and calling bookstores and libraries or um, other companies on your behalf. Um, if you want to be selling to the wholesalers, there's not so many wholesalers out there that you couldn't do that yourself. There's you know, maybe a dozen at the most. And then going after the gift market or the museum market or the bookstore market, I don't know which market is you're focused on, um, uh, or even the corporate market, you'd be better off hiring someone who works for you directly. You're probably not going to get a commission rep. All right, let's see. We've got, um, I can't believe how fast time flies on these things. It is already quarter of one. Let's see some other questions. Um, Somebody's asking if you can vary your discount at Ingram Wholesaler so that you give them one, Ingram Wholesaler, one discount for libraries and one discount for bookstores. No, no, you can't. Um, Ingram Spark or CreateSpace or however you decide to sell into the Ingram Wholesale world, Ingram is going to demand a 55% discount if you want bookstores to get 40%. If you even give them 52%, the bookstores are only going to get a 35% discount. Bookstores, they want 40%. That's their minimum. They don't need to order your book. Nobody needs your book. Unless there's somebody out there who, who stumbled across the cure for cancer and really knows you know, how to do that, or if you found the secret to staying young forever, then we all need your book. Um, but for the most part, there's not a wholesaler, bookstore, or library out there who believes they need your book. They may want your book, and the, but the only way they're going to order your book is if they get the discount because they need to make money. And um, the margins, you may say to yourself, well, bookstores are getting 40%. Trust me, guys, bookstores, it, those margins are razor slim. Their expenses are ridiculous. They need every penny of that 40%. Um, in many cases, they're paying for the shipping. There's a lot going on. And, you know, yes, why should the wholesaler keep 30%? Why, why if they're only giving the library 20%, why can't I adjust that discount? Because that's not how it works. Again, the wholesaler is doing a lot of work for that 30%. And if you want them to carry your book and to offer a proper discount, then you, you can't cherry pick that way. That's, that's not how it works, I'm afraid. The wholesalers do a lot of work for the libraries that they don't have to do for bookstores and it costs them a lot of money and that's why that's why they get that discount all right um so let's see uh d is say it has a question regarding reviews um he's collecting endorsements from business people who've agreed to read his book it's a great book by the way um and his plan is to include these um in the book description on Amazon and have them scroll across the book's website, opening pages on the book itself. That's good. I would recommend, David, that you consider making sure those endorsements, instead of in the description, you put them in the editorial reviews on Amazon. Amazon will quite often yank endorsements from the book description. I have seen them pull books down and, and put them on hiatus and on hold uh, when they see names and famous people in the book description, those belong in the review, but let's keep going. Uh, David is asking if I have any suggestions about how to leverage these endorsements, in particular to get on a public forum. Uh, the book makes sense, will shift your perception on the process, blah, blah, you know, so he's giving the thing. So uh, this woman who's a CFO of, of, of uh, a paper, a huge paper 
Industries Company, has given him a wonderful endorsement. Put them in the editorial review section on Amazon. Make sure that you post them um, as well at Ingram Spark so that they end up at Indigo, especially for you up in Canada. You want to be in Chapters Indigo. You want to get them up on BarnesandNoble.com, and that happens through Ingram Spark. But what I would do, if I were you, is I would go to Canva.com. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Canva. Um, here, let me quickly share my screen. You can, uh, for, you know, you click on the social media one. You find a background that that fits your, um, uh, let's say, you know, that fits. I don't know. I'm, I'm. You know, I, you're a business book, and so, you know, uh, but let me just grab this one right here just for kicks and giggles. You cut and paste the, uh, the quote right in here, David Rocks. You put their, their name right here. Who said it? Amy Collins from New Shelves. And then you save this. You download this. You, you know, you grab this, copy. You paste, you drag, you, you, so you've got a, a, a starting quote, an ending quote. You can turn this around, make it pretty. See how quick this is? So you get the quote there. Um, you've got the name of who said it. You save this, you download this, you start posting it on Instagram. You put it on Pinterest. You start sharing it on Facebook. Do one of these every three or four days. Now, I want to be careful with you guys. Again, that was Canva.com. Hi, me back again. I want you guys to be careful. When you're posting nice things about yourself online, keep the ratio light. When you're online on social media, make sure that you're being of help to people and you're being charming two, three, four, five times. Then post a glowing review of how awesome you are. If you're posting five reviews in a row about how people love you, you're going to you're going to be branded the the class bore. Uh, no one's going to want to hang out with you or see you online. So please be careful when you're doing that. But that's one way to get them into a public forum. That's just that's just one idea I can come up with. Um, another one, if you've got um, longer, you know, more uh, in-depth quotes, maybe use that quote as the start of a blog. Maybe if somebody, you know, was praising your real life examples, you should write a blog about the importance of integrity in data and using real life examples and not fudging data. And then do some research on books and authors that did fudge data and how much trouble they got into. Write an article about how important it was when you were writing your book to keep your data clean. And you can use this quote from so-and-so about how you know how in, how much integrity your book has so there's lots of different ways to get it out there um, you can actually write an article on someone else's site on a particular topic using a, a quote or an endorsement that someone gave you so there's a few ideas that I've come up with I hope that's helpful keep them on Amazon make sure you post them on Ingram Spark uh, make sure you uh, put them into your Bowker account, in, in books and print. Get them everywhere. Put them on your website, but also send them out on social media carefully, quietly, with a little bit of class, guys. Don't don't be all pushy. And uh, and I love that Canva thing. Um, I use it all the time. I try not to do it too often, um, but every once in a while, when someone says something really nice about me, of course I'm going to post it. What are you nuts? Uh, an anonymous attendee is asking if somebody can offer a private direct sale discount to a bookstore owner. Absolutely. It is called consignment sales. What you do is you go to the bookstore and you tell them you can offer your book on consignment. And this is how consignment works. You give them whatever discount you want. Give them a 30, 40, 50% discount. Depends on, you know, you and the bookstore owner will work that out. They will take five copies of your book. Just, I'm just giving you an example let's say five copies to start, and they'll stick it on a shelf, or, a, or let's say you even offer them a deeper discount. Give them a 60% discount if they agree to put it front, of ta you know, front table or front of store in a window. Offer them a little extra discount um, in exchange for prime placement. You are going to have to offer them something for prime placement. 
Um, you know, the way they might want to do it is that you offer them a 40% discount plus $1 a book credit for every book they sell if they keep it at a front table or a front window. So they'll put it up wherever you've agreed that they're going to put it. And at the end of the month, you contact them and ask them how many they've sold and would they like more. And you do this at the end of every 30 days. How many did you sell? Would you like more? You send them an invoice. They send you a check. And yes, you can do that. Now that's great to a couple of stores in your neighborhood. That gets a little exhausting when you want to be in two or 300 bookstores across the country. But it is absolutely possible and it's called consignment sales and people do it all the time. It's a great way to get started. If you can't get a store to, to show interest at the beginning, it's a great way to get a couple of dozen bookstores to give you some love. Um, bum, bum, bum. Uh, T is asking uh, about commission sales reps and what the percentage is. Yes, uh, again, as I was telling A, uh, they'll take anywhere from a 10 to 15% discount off the net billable. Um, I would suggest that you guys go to the Napier site. Here, let me look that up real quick for you. Uh, we looked this up last week. Um, uh, National Association of Publisher, Independent Publisher Reps. Um, bum, bum, bum. NAI. Yes. National Association of Independent Publisher Representatives. Here is the URL. I'm going to put it into the chat box for you. And uh, what I would recommend is, I'm putting it right in the chat box, that you guys, if you're curious about how they work and what the website, uh, what the contract looks like and what the terms are, go to that website. Uh, it's got a list of reps there. Again, they're not going to want to work with you until you can make them some money. Um, but, but if you can, if you're one of the, the publishers that can do it, um, then absolutely. Uh, go to naipr.org, napier.org, and they will give you the information that you need about how you work with commission reps. Um, okay, we've got another question here. Jean is saying, put them in Bowker. I'm confused. For those of you who bought your own ISBNs through myidentifiers.org, myidentifiers.org, you have complete access to your books and print listing which means that you've got complete access to your book description in books in print. If you get a glowing endorsement from the head of Coca-Cola and you're a you know, leadership, you'd better put that glowing endorsement with their name in your book description in, at myidentifiers.com. I go into myidentifiers.com on a regular basis every couple of months and I, I switch up my book description, I, I poke up my bio, Get that SEO going. Get those keywords churning through myidentifiers.com. That's if you bought your own ISBN and if you have published your book yourself. If you have a publisher, you won't have access to that. But uh, if you've done it on your own, you should be going into your listing at myidentifiers.com. For every ISBN, they want it's a seven-page it's a seven-page description. They want the title. They want the author name. They want book description. They want they want everything. They want to see your cover. They'd love to, you for you to upload your interior so they can get it up on Google Books. Do all of that, guys. Uh, that it, that's a wonderful way to get your SEO up and running. All right, we have three minutes left, and I believe I've answered everyone's questions. Um, hmm, let's let's go to the emails just to say. Um, uh, uh, T is asking, what is a way of keeping t the total national or international sales through Bowker or another site? Who tracks total book sales for all ISBNs? Nobody, uh, T, tra uh, tracks all book sales. But the closest you can come is through BookScan, Nielsen BookScan. You may remember the Nielsen name from radio and television, um, you know, Nielsen ratings for television. Well, they also track book sales, but they don't track them all, and they don't track them internationally. Uh, they track probably about 95% of them. And if you want to know what your Nielsen sales tracking is, any one of you can access your Nielsen reported sales by going through your author, uh, your author central account on Amazon.com. Amazon.com, their, their author central program, which if you don't have an author central account, get one. Grab your name, grab your book, and once your book is listed, linked to your name on Author Central, 
Um, let me type that URL into the chat box. Let's see, www.authorcentral.amazon.com. That URL I'm very confident of. Um, once your book is listed to you, linked to you, it takes a few days, um, you can go up to reports, click on Nielsen Book Scan, and take a look at your life to date sales, your last four weeks, your last 13 weeks. And, but again, that's just domestic. Um, I have no way of knowing um, how many sales you've sold internationally, I'm afraid. But if you are the publisher, you know how many orders you're getting from your different ebook wholesalers and the different, if you're print on demand especially, your print on demand company knows how many orders you're getting and they do break out your sales by domestic versus international. All right. Well, it is the top of the hour. We have, uh, you guys have blown another full hour with me. I'm looking forward to seeing you next week. I will be in Breckenridge, Colorado. I will be speaking at the Author You Extravaganza next week, but I will pop up to my hotel room and, and, and see you all at noon Eastern, noon Eastern uh, next Friday for Free Advice Friday. I appreciate you all hanging out with me every week. Uh, this is an ongoing program. It is no longer a 10-week program. It is an ongoing program until you're sick of me. So um, when you guys stop asking questions, I will stop spending my lunch hour with you on Fridays. I look forward to seeing you all next week. Please go to newshelves.com slash FAF. Let me type that in, newshelves.com slash FAF. And... Um, and you will see previous weeks. You can read the transcript if you don't want to hear my dulcet tones for a solid hour. You can see the questions that were asked. You can see the answers that came up. And um, I will see you guys next week at Free Advice Friday. Bye, guys.